Hey guys, this is John. This is the day the chess world has waited for, game one of the 2018 World Chess Championship between the reigning world champion Magnus Carlsen of Norway and the challenger Fabiano Caruana of the United States. This is a number one versus number two matchup on the rating list. These guys are just a few rating points apart on the most recent FIDE list. This match is going to be a doozy. There's a lot of excitement for this one, a lot of close predictions. I didn't make a video releasing my predictions, but I do believe Magnus will win this match. And I held that opinion even before this first game. I won't spoil the result if you happen to be living under a rock and haven't seen the result of this game yet. I'm going to be making highlight videos for these games, as many games as I can. I'm not going into an exhaustive, deep analysis just to let you know right off the bat. I believe to fully appreciate these games, you do need to do that. Uh, World Championship games are some of the highest quality games ever produced in chess. So summarizing it in 10 to 20 minutes is not really... Uh, feasible as far as getting all the variations and truly appreciating what these great players do. But I'm going to try to make some highlight videos just because uh, I'm a little pressed for time during this match. And also I will be going to London about halfway through the match. I'll be there November 19th through the 25th doing some chessable work. We have an event on November 20th and also hopefully making it to a game or two myself. It's always been a bucket list item to go to a world chess championship. So let's dig into this first game. Fabiano had white. And he opened with e4, not a surprise. The time control in this match, by the way, 100 minutes for 40 moves. Then they get 50 minutes for the next 20 moves, 15 minutes till the end of the game with a 30 second increment throughout. So this can produce very long games, that sort of time control. And Magnus, a bit of a surprise, he plays the Sicilian, c5. Objectively, uh, one of the strongest responses to e4 along with e5, but both these guys are big e4, e5 experts. So that was probably the expected move, but... Magnus, kind of like he did against Karyakin in the first game in their 2016 match, if you recall, Magnus, he threw a bit of a curveball. He was white and he played the Trumpowski attack, which is not at all a normal opening for the World Chess Championship. On the other hand, the Sicilians played all, been played a lot in World Championships, but to come out fighting like that when I think a lot of people were expecting a more Magnus-like slow pace to the opening in the first game uh, is, is quite interesting and hopefully telling for the excitement level in this match. So Fabiano played knight f3, and after knight c6, d4 is the way to go into the open Sicilian if Fabiano wants to do that. He is a big expert in the open Sicilian. And if that had happened, I was trying to think what lines Magnus might have gone for. Um, I would suspect either an accelerated dragon, g6, or a Taimanov, e6. I don't really see Magnus as like a classical Sicilian player playing knight f6, knight c3, d6. And there are some other options too. Nor do I see him as a Sveshnikov, which is knight f6, knight c3, e5. That just doesn't seem like a line he would prefer because it does create this weakness on d5. But maybe we'll find out later in the match if Magnus repeats this. I kind of doubt he would repeat this line, but you never know. In a match, a lot of the decisions that they make in the opening are based on psychology and understanding the dynamics of the match. So throwing an early curveball if you can is important. But Fabiano didn't challenge him in the open Sicilian. He played bishop b5. This is the Ross Limo variation. This is considered uh, at least as good as d4, as far as I know, from a theoretical perspective. Perspective. It's a very challenging move. You can kind of think of it as the Rui Lopez against the knight c6 Sicilian. So white has this implied threat of taking the knight and doubling up black's pawns. And that is indeed what happened. So Magnus played g6. There was a capture. d3. h3. This is a typical maneuver for black knight d7. This enables black to play e5. It unleashes the bishop. And also this is a prelude to uh, what, what Magnus does coming up, which is maneuvering the knight to f8. So bishop e3, e5, Fabiano castles, b6. This just reinforces the c5 square. And now knight h2. I was paying a lot of attention to the time usage. So these are long games. And I, was, I did not watch this game all the way through. I was kind of checking in and out. Uh, that's one of the nice things about following a world championship is that you can go away and do something for a few hours, come back, and the position may not have greatly changed. <laughs> but I was definitely paying attention to the time situation in the opening because Fabiano spent a lot of time for some of the upcoming decisions. He spent 18 minutes on this move, knight h2, making way for the f4 pawn push. Um, hard to say what he was thinking about. I'm not an expert on these positions. I do know sometimes white tries to play on the queen side. The idea is like this and like this. 
In fact, there was a famous Fisher versus Spassky game from their 1992 rematch, I believe, where uh, Fisher played a very timely B4 in a Ross Limo. But Fabiano decides to go with this plan, Knight H2. But just to give you an idea, so this is move 10, Knight H2. He spent 18 minutes here. He spent 10 minutes on the next move, which is F4, which looks like just the normal follow-up to Knight H2. Uh, on move 13 coming up, he spent 13 minutes. Move 16, he spent 16 minutes. So, yeah, he was he was burning a lot of clock early on in the game, leading many people to speculate that he was just not comfortable with this uh, opening and the decision that Magnus made to go for the Sicilian. So, as I said, Magnus puts the knight here on f8 and then brings the bishop out. h6. I also saw some speculation on Twitter uh, in particular, there's this one uh, Norwegian journalist you should definitely follow if you're on Twitter. His name is Tarjai Svensson, and he is a very close person to Magnus. He's followed Magnus throughout his entire career, and he posts some great, great updates. So I believe it was Tarjai saying that the Norwegian supercomputer, which is this supercomputer called SESS, S-E-S-S-E, -S -S -E, it has a website out there. You can go and follow the World Championship Games live. And this Norwegian supercomputer actually preferred the way that Magnus was playing here. Uh, I believe starting with this H6 move. So there was some speculation maybe Magnus has been training with this particular computer. Because um, Magnus, he has this reputation as not being an opening expert. But in fact, I think a lot of people are pushing back on that notion. And in fact, Magnus does prepare his openings, just maybe not in the straightforward always stick to the mainline approach that other players do. So Magnus, on for you know whatever his preparation was here, he had a big time advantage. Um, and it was building as we come up to the middle game here. So he goes for this plan of playing h6 and g5, which allows him to play knight g6 in the future, if he would like. Queen d6. So Fabiano has seemingly played logical moves. He's doubled his rooks on the f-file. But it's very hard for white to meaningfully open up the position here because black has the bishops and the the pressure that you're generating against f7 is not really amounting to much with this light square bishop so i think this line is delicate to play the white side of this Russ limo variation because you have crippled black structure but unless you're playing in some sort of strategic fashion i wonder if um black is at all worse in these positions because always you have to be worried about black unleashing the bishop pair if white tries to abruptly open the position so i th think they're very delicate maybe appropriate for a world championship match because we get to see their understanding on display so fabiano plays knight g4 this is move 16 again i said this was a long think 16 minutes to play this move magnus castles queenside fabiano sinks this knight into f6 the knight looks pretty there but after knight d7 magnus is trying to trade it off so Fabiano goes back, knight h5, hitting the bishop on g7, bishop e5. And now Fabiano kind of goes into lockdown mode. He plays g4, looking to control that f5 square. So Magnus plays f6, b3 is played, kind of a stabilizing move, discouraging black from playing c4 later, bishop f7. Fabiano plays knight d1. So he is willing to allow Magnus to take this knight. And that would be a principal decision to make if you're black here. Take on h5 and maybe then play knight f8, looking to get the knight to e6. And yeah, these are definite uh, weaknesses that white has. Magnus could, in fact, pursue the same plan he played in the game. But maybe he didn't like this. Uh, one line I was just looking at was moving the queen here for Fabiano. Sending the queen to g4 and then trying to reposition this knight, trying to get it to e3 and then into f5 later. And... Black is probably better here, but maybe Magnus didn't want to allow this clear plan from Fabiano. So this is a critical moment in the game here. I said I was going to try to hit the highlights. So after knight d1, Magnus played knight f8 and just gives the f6 pawn. He doesn't take the knight on h5. He lets Fabiano take on f6. There's one, two, three attackers, both rooks and the knight, and only two defenders, the bishop and the queen. So sacrifices this pawn, and... This was a, a clear indication that Magnus was spoiling for a fight with Black in game one. So maybe trying to play off Fabiano's nerves. Although Fabiano has some of the best nerves in the business, this is his first world championship match, and Magnus has a lot more match experience than Fabiano does. So maybe that played into the decision. So now Magnus brings his knight around, and he has his eye on this juicy f4 square. 
So Fabiano backs up the knight. There is a trade now. And now the knight jumps in. So this next move is move 25 for white. Fabiano is already in severe time pressure. And he needs to make another 15 moves. Has to make it till move 40. So he takes this invading knight. Magnus recaptures with the pawn. And now a very important decision is made. And a poor one for Fabiano. So a lot of commentators were looking at rook takes f4, which is by far the most principled move in this position, sacrificing the exchange. And a possible line is bishop takes f4, queen takes f4. And I think if black goes for the end game like this, white has pretty good chances to uh, draw the game. I don't know that white's in a position to play for a win. Maybe if black plays some lackluster moves here, uh, white does need to activate their knight. It's equal material for now. White does have these pawns that are kind of discounted, and black may be able to win the h5 pawn in some cases, but this knight is coming up. White has a otherwise very good structure. I don't think Fabiano was worried about this scenario. I bet he was worried about Magnus taking once, but then keeping the queens on the board, so maybe giving a check. And white's king is quite open. So with limited time, perhaps he didn't want to imbalance the game in a way that uh, would further open his king and force him to make a lot of defensive moves with 15 moves to go. But, I mean, hindsight's twenty twenty. Like, these are such difficult decisions at the highest level, the most nerves to keep in mind to criticize. But Rook G2, as he played in the game, was a bad move, and Fabiano played that almost immediately. So Rook G2. Magnus plays Rook G8, challenging on the file. Queen E2. So you can see, just visually, white has a lot of pieces and pawns committed to the light squares. Everything except the king. And black has a dark square bishop. That's usually a bad sign. If you're essentially ceding one color complex to your opponent, that tends to be a very bad sign. So um, I was actually in my car at this moment driving to Starbucks. Go figure, I drink a lot of coffee. <laughs> and when I got to Starbucks, I saw um, that a couple moves had been played after this. And I was thinking the whole way there, this is not looking good for uh, Fabiano. Just the trend of this game and the, the fact that he had such little time. So there was a trade. Magnus plays queen e6, which threatens rook g8, skewering the queen to the king. So knight f2, he's trying to get the knight up to g4 to kind of plug some of the holes here, which does indeed happen. But now Magnus plays queen e8, and he's going to go after this h5 pawn. Remember that Magnus is down a pawn currently because he gave up that f6 pawn way back when, but now he gets to regain it by taking on an h5. And Fabiano still has to wriggle free, so he plays queen f3, and now he bails with his king, king f2. Magnus plays bishop c7, making sure his bishop is not under attack. King e2, queen g5. And I think that rook g2 move was such a significant mistake that white should be losing here queen g after queen g5. And this was the focus of many of the commentaries I was seeing. Um, this is a moment where Fabiano plays knight h2 and Magnus plays h5. A lot of people were criticizing Magnus's decision because... It actually seems like he should switch sides of the board and play in the, in the style of the principle of two weaknesses, which says that it's difficult to win a game based on one weakness alone or even playing on one side of the board alone, and that you maximize your chances of winning and stretching your opponent's defensive resources by opening up a second front or attacking them elsewhere. So based on that principle, Magnus had a very good opportunity here on move 34 to play queen e5 and try to get his queen into b2. So queen e5 has that idea in mind going after this weak c2 pawn. Also, it allows black to play rook g3, try to invade with the rook. Uh, there are a couple other ways to do this, like queen f6, queen g7, but queen e5 seems to make the most sense. You don't block the rook in this case. And it looks very bad. And again, uh, that Norwegian supercomputer Cess was going crazy about this. And for the next few moves, Magnus has very good chances. But Magnus plays a kind of a restrictive move, h5, ensuring that there's no possibility of a queen trade Queen g4 check. Queen trade would be a godsend here for Fabiano. He would love to do that, especially in time pressure. But some cracks in the facade start to appear. So rook f2. Now Magnus plays queen g1, hoping to get the queen over this way. So kind of the same idea as queen e5, just in a different fashion. Fabiano plays this. So he's trying to hold the line on the f file. Magnus plays h4. King d2. Right around here, there were a couple moments where Fabiano could have pushed his e-pawn. So e5 might have been a decent try here to open up queen takes c6. And also maybe try to get in knight d2 to e4. So one possible line is 
if black chases this pawn, rook g5, just to give it up in a bid to activate. But here too, if the knight is no longer on f1, white has to think about the queen coming over. I'm not sure that uh, this would have been any better. But I understand what Fabiano was trying to do here. He's just trying to hold the line, make it till move 40. He doesn't want to make some major decision like e5. Material is equal right now. So if he can make it to time control and not lose something or fall victim to an attack, he can maybe hold this game. So king d2. Magnus plays a temporizing move as well. King b7, just hiding his king. c3. Bishop e5. King c2. Magnus brings the queen back to g7, targeting c3 twice. And now this is move 40 for Fabiano, knight h2. So looking for the knight coming into g4. And this was the next critical moment in the game. So the best move here is queen g1. Magnus had the opportunity to play this. And given the, the move number situation, it would have made sense to do this. Because after queen g1, Fabiano has nothing better than to come back to f1 with the knight. You absolutely can't allow the queen to come over here and target c3 and a2. White's going to be busted real quick if that happens. Note that rook f1 loses the knight on h2. So he would have to play knight f1. And then you could take a deep breath. Both players have reached time control. And maybe Magnus could find um, some sort of plan here. Maybe start slowly advancing. I think Cess was recommending b5 in a lot of cases. Slowly trying to march forward. But Magnus decides to take on c3. And he seemed visibly unhappy about the turn of developments here. Because after bishop takes c3, Fabiano can take on f4. And this was all Fabiano needed to stabilize the situation. Magnus played bishop d4, hitting the rook. But then comes queen f7. Remember I said that a queen trade would be a godsend to Fabiano. Now he's made time control. He can relax a little bit. He still managed to keep the material equal. And his knight looks a little passive right now, but it has squares it can come to. So rook e2 getting behind his pass pawn. Magnus takes that opportunity to go win the h pawn, which is probably his only chance to do something here to shake things up. But now this e pawn runs. And Magnus has to come all the way back with his rook. And Fabiano finds a straightforward way to play this position. The onus is still on white, still on Fabiano to uh, make a draw here. Because even though this pawn visually looks strong, black's h-pawn is a significant asset. If black gets a chance, he can maybe march his king back and outright win the e7-pawn. Oh, and by the way, the bishop, as it, as it is right now, is dominating this knight. Note that white's knight doesn't have... A lot of good squares to go to, especially the forward squares. But Fabiano comes up with a nice idea. He plays knight h6. Magnus pushes the h-pawn. And now knight f5. So having the knight defend this pawn. Now knight d6 is an idea he's flirting with. So bishop comes back to f6. So he can meet knight d6 with rook takes e7. But now a3. Which is a helpful move. Black plays b5. There's a bit of improving going on on the queen side. A trade here. And eventually black has to do something because this pawn is going to fall at any moment. Uh, if white wants to, Fabiano could play this and go pick it up when he likes. So Magnus decides to play bishop takes e7, kind of accelerating the scenario where after knight takes e7 and then h2, white gives up the knight forced. But we reach this endgame, three pawns versus two pawns. But they're all on the same side of the board. And despite the one pawn advantage and Magnus having a better pawn structure, black cannot win this position if white defends precisely. And for a player of Fabiano's caliber, this is a very straightforward draw. This is move 55. So Magnus pressed this for another 50 plus moves, but he did not get anywhere. Uh, the drama in this game had largely played out. We had a world championship lull in the play where you get these long grinding sessions where one side's trying to like eke out an advantage i understand why magnus played on here you know you gotta maximize your chances in a big match like this uh also it could be a good match strategy if he wants to try to wear fabiano down but nothing ever changed the evaluation of this position this end game so there was a lot of maneuvering in the three versus two if you're white just make sure you stay close to these pawns with your king so you can defend them at all times Black has a, a real hard time ever winning, say, the d4 pawn, because if his king gets too frisky, he's going to expose himself here or here. Also, white has a lot of checks to give from the side, too. So 
there isn't a whole lot to analyze here. Of course, don't trade rooks and go into a pawn end game. That would be ludicrous down a pawn like this. You could you could make an argument that maybe Fabiano should think about playing d5, but he didn't even ever deem it necessary to do that. Trying to trade a pair of pawns. And as I said, Magnus eventually played a5 himself. Or, sorry, not a5 himself. He traded the a-pawn for the d-pawn more accurately. <laughs> this game was so long, you sometimes forget how parts of it go. So, yeah, this is move 105. Rook takes a6, rook takes d4. There was some speculation, well, Magnus is going to play this on for another 50 moves before the 50 move rule kicks in, make a pawn move or a capture. <laughs> but that didn't happen. Yeah, so in general, the, the more pawns that are traded in this situation, the closer the defensive side is the side that's down upon is to a draw and that is indeed what happened here very soon you can see that fabiano is keeping his rook to attacking this pawn at all times and just too difficult for magnus to make any sort of progress here um, can't play king c4 because you actually lose after rook takes c6 that would be a big no-no so there's no way for black to win that b4 pawn white can just defend it at all times so the game was drawn here on move 115. So definitely some interesting moments in this first game, especially in the first part of the game, the, the decision by Magnus to go for the Sicilian fighting opening. I do wonder what Magnus had in mind if Fabiano went for d4. Maybe we'll get a chance to see later in the match. Some definite fighting chess being played by Magnus. In particular, I think we can single out that decision to play knight f8 right here and sacrifice the f6 pawn. That was a good fighting decision but also some uncharacteristic errors by Magnus. I think this is a position he would normally win without too much trouble. And pretty bizarre that he didn't he didn't try to swing his queen around this way. Even later, he had that opportunity when White was trying to blockade on the F-file. This still was looking really good. Uh, another possibility, by the way, I didn't mention, but there was a possibility of playing Rook G3 at various moments too if Magnus wanted to sack an exchange and go for it here. But he never, he never pulled the trigger on that. And by the time the pawn was captured on c3, queen takes f4, most of the danger had passed for Fabiano, and he made a draw pretty easily after this. Time wasn't that big of a factor. Magnus's chances were all right before the time control. So this is fancy, by the way. Um, I'm doing the rest day coverage for chess.com. So I will be doing... The, the format of this match is they play two games. And then there's a rest day, and then they play two more games. So I will be doing the first rest day coverage for uh, the match on the 11th, November 11th, November 14th, which is a Wednesday, and November 17th, which is a Friday. And then I'll be going to London myself. But thanks to chess.com for this layout that they provided me with. Um, and we also have the scores, too, down below right here. That's kind of nifty. I'll keep that updated throughout the match. And as I said, I'll try to do these highlight videos. I don't know how it's going to work when I'm actually in London. Maybe I'll even do some vlog-style videos. But there's a lot of places to watch this match. Chess.com, Chess24, guys like Chess Network are streaming it. Uh, the Chess Bras, definitely go check out them and support them. A lot of people are going to be doing long-form, real deep analysis, I'm sure. I saw Alex Yermolinsky for Chess.com. The Chess24 lineup, by the way, for streaming the match is absolutely stacked. They've got Peter Spidler and Alexander Grishuk, Sopiko Guramashvili. That's their main commentary crew. Uh, I heard Anish Giri is going to get involved as well. So we're really spoiled for choice in the chess world right now as far as options to follow this match. So do take advantage of that. Uh, Egad Mator, very popular YouTuber these days. He'll probably be doing commentary. I saw that he's in London. So you can definitely check out his recaps as well. Um, and I look forward to the further games here. This is... Uh, going to be a fun match to follow. Again, I do think Magnus will win this match. That's been my prediction from the beginning. My my head says Magnus. My heart says Fabiano. I do like Fabiano a lot. I want him to win. He's a super nice guy. Amazing chess player, but got to give the nod to Magnus. But who knows? Maybe this first game, uh, he, Magnus has been, been struggling against Fabiano of late. So, you know, he hasn't managed to crack Fabiano's defenses when they've when they've clashed recently, at least in classical. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and I'll be back again soon with the Game 2 analysis. Bye, guys.